Do you want to create an Amazon EC2 instance that you can eventually deploy a Rails application onto? Stick around to find out how. I'm Thomas with BrainTrust Digital. I'm a full stack developer obsessed with learning. If you're interested in learning full stack, please subscribe below to receive new content. In this AWS Rails tutorial, we're going to walk through how to create an Amazon EC2 instance that you can eventually deploy a Rails application onto. First, we'll start in the AWS console where we will create our EC2 instance as well as our security groups. Next, we're going to SSH into the instance and then we can install all of the software we need to deploy and serve our application. We're going to be using Nginx as our web server and Fusion Passenger as our app server. So I'll walk you through the process of installing all of those things, including Postgres and setting up various users and everything you need to serve your application. We won't actually deploy the application onto the server until the following video. The application we will eventually deploy is our AWS Rails application that we've been building up slowly throughout the previous videos. The first video being your first Rails application, which I'll link here in the cards and down here in the description. Next, we added SES programmatic email sending, which I will also link here in the card and down here in the description. Finally, last week, we added device users and admin accounts so that once we eventually deploy this application, users will be able to log in. With that out of the way, let's get into the AWS EC2 instance tutorial. The first thing you want to do is navigate to the AWS console. Then you can go down to find services and search for EC2. Before we actually create our instance, I typically prefer to create my security group first. Security groups in AWS are essentially a virtual firewall for your instance. Security groups allow you to create rules, to control the inbound and outbound traffic. Let's go ahead and create a security group now. So you click the orange create security group, you give it a name, we will call our security group ADBS Rails SG. We're gonna give it a description. Uh, this can be anything. In our case, I'm just gonna mention the type of traffic that we're going to allow. HTTP, HTTPS, and SSH. Next, we need to add inbound and outbound rules. So click add rule. Then from the drop down, we're going to select HTTP. We'll keep adding until we get one for each inbound traffic source. Okay, next you can look at the source. Here in our source, we're going to allow inbound traffic from anywhere for our HTTP and HTTPS. But for SSH, let's just scope this to our IP. This is just an added layer of security so that people from a different IP address can't try to SSH into our server. Next, we need to handle our outbound rules. In this case, we want everybody to be able to access this server, since this is just going to be the public facing AWS Rails website. And by default, AWS automatically populates this with all outbound traffic. So let's just set this to anywhere. One last note, you'll see up here the uh, IP address ranges. You're seeing two ranges, two rules for HTTP, one for IPv4 and one for IPv6. So it's just something to note that while we only created one rule here, it's actually going to create both of the IPv4 and v6 rules for us. It's just a convenience thing that uh, AWS does in their security group form. I just wanted to point this out in case you, you weren't quite sure what was going on there. Next, we'll click create security group. Now that we have our security group created, the next thing we want to do is create our EC2 instance. So let's go back to the EC2 dashboard and click launch instance. So the first thing we need to do here is choose an AMI or Amazon machine image. This is essentially just a machine image of, an, of the operating system that we'd like to use that it will pre-populate our instance with. In our case, we're gonna be creating an Ubuntu 2004 server. This is a new release as of a couple of weeks ago. So it should be down towards the bottom here. There we go. We'll click select. Next, you could choose the type of your instance. Essentially what you're choosing here is the amount of virtual CPUs and memory, as you can see down these two columns. In our case, we're gonna choose a T2 medium as that's gonna be plenty of processing power and RAM for our needs. But if you have specific processing and memory requirements, you can navigate to the uh, EC2 cost calculator to figure out which specific instance you wanna use and how much that's gonna cost you per month. This particular T2 medium should cost us around $20 per month. Next, let's click configure instance details. 
Here you have options to change the specific VPCs or subnets that your instance is going to be dropped into, as well as being able to pass along commands to run immediately upon starting the instance. Um, in our case, we're just going to leave everything as is and add storage. Let's just bump this up a little bit so we've got some space to work with. We'll say 30 gigs for now and move on to add tags. We'll click the add tag button. This one, we're just gonna give the server a name. AWS Rails prod one. I typically like to name my instances using this convention. First section is uh, some sort of identifier so that I can quickly understand which application this EC2 instance is serving. Next, I'll typically put some sort of keyword that'll let me know the environment, whether it be stage or production. Lastly, this is optional, of course, but uh, then I'll put a dash one there to make it easy for future expansion. Say in the future that we add several servers with load balancing and such, it's very easy to identify which specific production server that we want to work on. Next, let's configure our security groups. So since we've already created a security group, you can click select from existing. Had you not already created a security group, you can create one in the form. I just tend to prefer to create my security group ahead of time. So we'll click select an existing security group. We're gonna select our ADBS Rails security group. Then click review. Here you can see all of the selections we made across the forms. Once you're satisfied with your choices, you can click launch. Amazon defaults to a passwordless login, meaning we're required to have a key pair to log in. I've got some tutorials on key pairs, if this is a newer concept to you, uh, that I can link in the description. But basically, this is just a way for Amazon to authenticate that we are who we say we are and allow us to log into the server. Here from the dropdown, you can choose to either create a new key pair or use an existing one. In my case, I just, I'm just going to use my existing key pair and acknowledge that I do have access to that on my local machine. If you choose to create a new key pair, you're gonna to want to download that key pair. Just save that key pair down to your computer and then follow the SSH config tutorial so you can get everything set up. Next, we'll click launch instances. Our instances are now launching, so you just have to be patient for a few minutes while this completes. We're just gonna click View Instances. I'll pause the video here, and then we'll come back once complete. Now that our instance was successfully created, we need to log into our instance and install some software packages on that instance so that we can serve our Rails application from that server. There are parts of this that will feel familiar and might remind you of the Create Your First Rails App tutorial a few videos back, as some of the packages we're gonna be using are the same in this case. Before we SSH into our server and install those packages, I typically like to create a few random passwords that we will use for our new deploy server user and our Postgres user. So to do so, let's go to the command line. I'm gonna paste in a curl command that I run. This command uses the API of the random.org website to generate a few passwords. I don't wanna to have to think or create new passwords as people typically tend to default to passwords they've already used, and then you have the same password for everything, which is not very secure. Instead, I typically use this command to generate random passwords for me. So we'll walk through this here quickly. First, we're curling the random.org passwords endpoint. Next, we're passing in a variable num, which is the number of passwords that we're going to return. In this case, it's two, one for our deploy user and one for our Postgres user. Next is L-E-N for length. In this case, I have 15. You could do more or less, whatever you feel comfortable with. You're gonna pass in the format as plain so that you will only get the response of passwords since we're doing this through the command line. And an R-N-D of new, meaning they're not gonna reuse old passwords that have been generated. So we'll just get new passwords generated, two of them 15 characters long. So this is how I'll typically generate two quick passwords for myself so that they're random and secure, and then I'll store them in a password manager, like a keychain on a Mac or one password or something similar. Uh, but for now, I'll typically just generate one of those. I'm not going to use any of these ones that I've displayed publicly. I'll generate a couple more off screen and use those for this server. I just wanna interrupt for one second and see if you're finding value. Please subscribe below, hit the like button, turn on the bell notification for for future notifications of, of content like this. And if you are, we have a limited time offer. Our coworker here, Bear, will perform one trick per subscriber. Yes. Down. Yes. Roll over. Good boy. You're the goodest boy. Good boy. Down. Down. Oh my gosh. We're going viral, Bear. 
Now that we've got our random passwords created and stored in our password manager of choice, let's go ahead and SSH into our server. In the console, we're gonna click next to the server and click connect. This command will look slightly different as it's gonna include the name of your key pair. So you'll copy that command, close, we'll switch over to terminal, cd into our SSH folder and connect, yes. Okay, now we're connected to our server. The first thing we wanna do is create a deploy user sudo add user named deploy. We need to provide a new password. So let's switch back over to our password manager and paste it here in the command line. We'll paste our password one more time and say yes. Now that we've created our deploy user, we need to add super user permissions to this user. Now let's switch to our new user to provide the new password we just created from our password manager. And then let's see into, into the new folder for that user. Okay, now we've created our deploy user and we're in our deploy folder, we need to generate some SSH keys for the server. I've already got a video tutorial on how to generate and manage your SSH keys. So I'm just gonna roll through this really quickly. Um, and I'll link that video in the description and the card in case you need more information there. Now that our new server has a set of SSH keys, I'm going to add my local machine's personal SSH key so that I can easily log into this server. I just grab my public key from my local machine and I'm going to paste this here in the authorized keys. Before we install our packages, we need to update a few more repositories. So I'm going to paste these lines in here. And I'll link everything in a gist so you don't have to remember it or try to copy it down. Basically what we're doing here is adding the most current repositories for Node, Yarn, and Redis. Now we can go ahead and install our packages. We're going to be installing several packages, so I'll just paste those on the screen now and walk through it. The first thing we're going to do is update our repositories. Then we're going to install all the various packages. I'm not going to go through and explain each one as that would take far too long. Just know that these are all the base packages you'll need to run a Rails application on your new Amazon EC2 instance. Finally, you can see I'm passing a dash Y flag. Each one of these packages is going to ask if we allow it to take up space on our new server. If you pass dash Y, you won't have to say yes after each individual package. Now we're going to install RBM, similar to our previous Rails app tutorial. This time we're going to install it via Git. So we're just going to paste these in. Again, I'll include these in a gist that'll be linked in the description. Now that we've got RBM and Ruby build, we just need to update our bash RC to include a few lines to automatically init RBM. To do so, you'll type sudo nano bash rc. At the bottom of this file, we're just going to paste in a few lines. These lines just export the path to RBM, then initialize it, finally exporting the path to Ruby build. So we're going to save this file, and we'll run exec shell to reload. Now, just like we did locally, we're going to use RBM to install with RBM install 271. This will take a few minutes, so we'll just pause the video here and wait till this is complete. Now that our version of Ruby is installed, let's set RBM to use this as the global version. And you can double check this by saying Ruby V to output the version. Perfect. Next, let's install Bundler. You can double check this install by typing bundle-v see that we have 2.1.4. We're gonna be using Nginx as our web server and Fusion Passenger as our app server. So let's install those packages now. Now that we have Passenger and Nginx installed, we need to tell Passenger to use RBM for its Ruby version. Next, we need to complete some Nginx config. 
So let's CD into the Etsy Nginx Sites Enabled folder. We can get rid of the default file here. And then we need to create a new Nginx configuration file for our application. In this case, it's gonna be AWS Rails. Typically, I name these to correspond with the domain name. And we can paste in our server block and walk through it. The server name is gonna be the domain name, aws-rails.com. When we would deploy, which we'll do in the next tutorial, we're going to deploy to the folder of AWS underscore Rails. Next, we're turning passenger on and telling it that this is the production environment. Finally, there's a little bit of action cable config here, which we're not currently using, but we may use in a future tutorial. After that, we're telling Nginx to allow up to 100 meg uploads. While our app doesn't currently allow the users to upload things like profile pictures, uh, we'll do that in a future tutorial, so it's just nice to get that out of the way now. The last thing we're doing here is telling any routes that have assets or packs that we want the longest possible expires headers, which just means that we won't need to continually fetch these things if the user has already loaded the page. We're going to turn gzip static on. We'll go ahead and save this. Now that we have our server configuration, let's go ahead and start Nginx. The last thing we're going to do is create our Postgres user. So we'll switch to the Postgres user, create our new deploy user, and in this case we're going to use the second password that we created at the beginning of this tutorial. Then we will create a database for our future app that we will deploy in the next tutorial. We're going to call that Postgres database AWS underscore Rails underscore production. While you can't really see a lot of what we've completed here, we've made a lot of progress. In our next tutorial, we're gonna integrate Capistrano into our current Rails application. That will allow us to create a deployment to launch our Rails app onto this new 2004 Focal Fossa Ubuntu instance. You can actually flip over to the browser and check out the IP address given to us from the AWS EC2 console and see that we do in fact have Nginx running. This is going to get much more exciting in the next tutorial, though, when we are actually able to see our own Rails application. As always, please remember to like and subscribe. This really helps out the channel as we're a much smaller channel, still just getting started here. And feel free to leave questions or requests in the comment section below. I definitely make sure to take the time to read all of that, so let me know if you have anything you'd like me to cover, and I'll see if I can figure out a way to work that in. With that out of the way, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next AWS Rails tutorial.